then that's better, right? And uh, this is a hefty lecture. Hefty is our high energy frontier, uh, frontier high energy frontier initiative. Theory. Okay. Theory. Theory initiative. <laughs> and uh, that's in response to the fact that there are instruments in the world, like the uh, Large Hadron Collider, that pushes the energy frontier. And uh, we have a uh, initiative in the physics department uh, that's uh, to really look at the theory behind all that. And part of the initiative is to have public lectures so that the public can share our excitement on the new discoveries of this yeah, energy frontier. And so one of the professors who came here as part of the high energy frontier uh, theory uh, is uh, John Turning. And I'd like to introduce uh, John Turning to introduce the speaker tonight. Involved 
in, uh, at much, much shorter distances. The strong forces hold protons and neutrons together inside the nuclei of atoms. Uh, the weak force is uh, something that's responsible for uh, radioactivity. Uh, so, and these four basic interactions hold sway over an incredible range of distances uh, in the universe. Uh, is there a laser pointer, by the way? No, it's not a big deal. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'll just point. So, you know, this, in, this, in this picture we have essentially the entire, uh, everything we know about the observable universe from the uh, very largest distances to the very smallest distances, the biggest distances are around uh, 10 to the 28 centimeters, that's about the size of the observable universe, it's sometimes called the Hubble length scale. <clears throat> the very tiniest distances we've, uh, we've probed or we're about to go to are around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, that's about a billion times smaller than the atom. Thank you very much. And, you know, uh, everywhere in between, something amazing happens. Um, so we have galaxies that are a million times smaller than the universe, we have the uh, solar system, the Earth's sun distance around 10 to the 13 centimeters. We are hundreds of centimeters tall. Uh, DNA and, uh, uh, and atoms are around 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Protons and neutrons are around 10 to the minus 14 centimeters big. And uh, so this is really everything uh, we know about, uh, uh, we probe about nature experimentally. And we're about to, uh, with uh, new experiments, probe the very frontiers. So the Large Hadron Collider, uh, which we'll talk a lot about, is about to probe distances of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And also something we'll talk less about is that uh, other experiments uh, uh, measuring properties of the universe on a very large scale are really pushing the frontier of what's going on on the, on the very largest distances as well. All right, but I'm going to clean up the picture a little bit because I'm a theoretical physicist. Um, and uh, we're going to focus on the important scales, so like humans and DNA are missing. <laughs> um, so, so, so again, these are these are the two scales. The entire last uh, slide was between here and there, um, uh, and there's a third scale of added around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, um, uh, which has another name. It's called the Planck length. We'll talk about it in a second. But actually, uh, before uh, I go through the rest of the talk, I want to spend a microsecond, perhaps longer. Uh, talking about um, something that sounds very dull, but is actually kind of important. I want to tell you a little bit about how physicists think about units. So, um, so far I've been, uh, I've been, I've been using um, centimeters and familiar human units, and I'll do that throughout the rest of the talk too, don't, don't worry. Uh, but you should know that, that centimeters and kilograms and seconds are completely artificial human construction. Uh, a meter, after all, what, what, if, if you say that uh, so-and-so is two meters tall, uh, what it means is that that person is uh, two of some bar that was left in Paris 100 years, years ago at Paul. Okay? So just because some people put a bar in some jar in Paris and decided to call that a meter, um, uh, what, what we really mean is the ratio of the height of the person to the, to the size of that bar is two. Let's say you wanted to communicate to an alien how tall you were. It would be useless to tell them it's two meters tall unless they happen to go to Paris and uh, get access to that uh, to that. Uh, to that, to that, to that bar. Uh, instead, what 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 we do is talk about things in in a much more uh, uh, in, in a more meaningful way, which would allow us to communicate with the aliens. Um, first of all, uh, in this branch of physics, both the effects of relativity and the effects of quantum mechanics are important. So uh, the the corresponding constants that go with those notions, the speed of light and uh, Planck's constant, um, we actually use units where we put these things equal to one. Uh, and what that means is that uh, everything else, everything else, um, is uh, can 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 be can be associated with one kind of either a length scale or a mass scale or a time scale. We conventionally choose to talk about uh, energy scales, uh, and and the idea is that bigger and bigger energies are correspond to smaller and smaller distances, smaller and smaller times. Um, so uh, by convention, uh, we, we use the uh, this energy scale that's that's uh, that's called a giga electron volt. Uh, it, uh, actually, calling it a giga electron volt is also a little too human. Um, what this is really, what, what this really is, what you can tell the alien is that this is around the mass of the proton. So aliens know what protons are; they know what the mass of the proton is. And so there's a mass associated with the proton, which is about one giga electron volt. That's what we call it as humans. But in these units, everything can be expressed in terms of that mass. So uh, a length 
is an inverse of that mass. So I am around 10 to the 16th inverse gay electron volt. What that means, if I told this to the alien, they would know that if they put 10 to the 16 protons, end to end to end to end to end, they would make a me. Okay? So that's, that, that's, that's how I can communicate the uh, information. See, this is not human-based units. It's natural-based base units. Okay? My mass is around 10 to the 29 giga electron volts. That gives the alien information built out of roughly 10 to the 29 atoms, because most of the mass of the atoms is in uh, protons. If you're very lucky, the lecture time will be around 10 to the 27 inverse GeV. Uh, uh, that's 10 to the 27 times of the amount of time it takes light to traverse the distance across a proton. So these are what we call natural units. I won't use them a lot throughout the talk, but every now and then I'll slip uh, into them. And I want you to know it's not, it's not capricious. These are really the way nature wants to talk about units, not the way uh, French people want to talk about it. <laughs> Okay, and, and this actually has, uh, has, some, has some very interesting immediate ramifications. Something many of you learned in high school is that if you talk about the, uh, the electric force between two electrons, let's say, uh, that, uh, oh my goodness, I, I wrote it down wrong. Uh, oh, sorry, this is an energy. This is the electrical energy between a, uh, between a pair of electrons. Uh, that it goes like one over the distance between them, where the force is an inverse square law, like uh, Newton's law is also an inverse square law for gravity. Well, if we just write down what the what that energy stored in the uh, electric, uh, it, it, what the electric energy is, just by just by these unit arguments we went through, we see that the strength of the interaction, the thing that multiplies how quickly it dies off with uh, distance, uh, is just a pure number. It's just an actual, it's an honest pure number in nature. It's around 1 over 137. And that tells us something really interesting. The strength of electric forces around is a real number. It's a small number around 1 over 137. We don't know where that number comes from, but it's small. It's pretty small. So that's, that, that's interesting. Uh, electric forces, in some sense, are a little bit small. On the other hand, if we look at the uh, gravitational uh, attraction between a pair of objects, You've learned, again, in school, but it's G Newton times the product of the masses of the two objects. Uh, uh, and it scales, again, in the same way as the uh, electric force. It's an inverse square law force. The energy goes like one over the distance. And this exactly the same dimensional argument tells you that what we conventionally call the strength of gravity, this concept that Newton gave us, actually has units of length squared in these natural units. So, the strength of gravity isn't strong or weak in any sense. It's just weak at very large distances compared to this minuscule number, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And it's strong at very short distances compared to that number. So already we've learned something very basic just from this unit's argument, that there's a big difference between gravity and the other forces. Uh, gravity, the strength of gravity is something that's big near this tiny scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Uh, at larger distances, it's a shockingly weak force. And at short distances, it's a violently strong force. Not true for the other guys. OK. So now we can get going. So um, if we go back to that picture of the, uh, of the length scales in nature, um, uh, so now, now you know what this Planck length means. Okay? Th this, is, this is a length scale associated with, uh, with, with gravity. Uh, this is the size of the universe. Uh, and this is where we're about to go to with the LHC. It turns out every one of these uh, every one of these scales is associated with some very fundamental mystery in our understanding of nature today. Uh, at the very shortest distances, even though we haven't remotely been there uh, experimentally, uh, we have good thought experiments that I will tell you a little bit about that argue that the notion of space-time itself is doomed and has to be replaced by something new. That's very startling because uh, science in general and physics in particular, if nothing else, is about describing what happens as things move around in space and time. Uh, and yet, we have very solid arguments that space-time doesn't actually exist fundamentally. There's another very obvious feature of this picture, which is that there's an enormous separation between these various, uh, uh, these, these various uh, length scales. The universe is gigantic compared to this uh, scale of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, where there's also something exciting happening I'll tell you about. It's called the weak scale even more gigantic compared to this Planck length. So it looks like even though the universe is governed by microscopic laws at very short distances, it turns out to be very, very large. 
The universe is very macroscopic, despite the fact that it's governed by microscopic laws. Now, that might not bite you at first. I mean, elephants are big. Okay? It's not some deep mystery of uh, physics why elephants are big, um, uh, because elephants are made of lots and lots of atoms, for example. Actually, if you trace that question far back enough, you find that it really is mysterious. And it turns into the question that I'm posing here. Um, and actually, it is very, very mysterious. Uh, in fact, in our current picture of the world, it seems almost impossible for there to be a macroscopic universe. Wildly impossible for there to be a macroscopic universe. And yet, here we are, comfortably in this room, having a nice discussion. So I'll explain why that's, that's the case. But this is a really burning mystery. Why in a world that's, uh, that's governed by short distance laws uh, is there nonetheless a macroscopic universe? So those are the mysteries that I'm going to uh, talk about. And then I'll talk about what we might learn about these things from uh, experiments. So continuing our um, lightning review of the last 400 years, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the philosophy of this part of physics. Um, often, uh, the, the, often, this part of science is sort of characterized as a search for the ultimate building blocks of matter or something like that. And that's really not what it's about. In fact, most of us could care less about the ultimate building blocks of matter. Um, that's what chemists do. Yeah. Um, I, 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 some, many of my best friends are chemists. <laughs> um, no, but, but less, less jokingly, uh, we care about laws. We don't care about the actual uh, we, don't, we don't so much care about particles, we care about laws. And it's because for 400 years, we've discovered the following very bizarre and startling but inspiring thing, which is that things that seem radically different on the face of it turn out to be different aspects of the same underlying principle. This started with Newton, who realized that exactly the same force pulling the apple down to the earth was what kept the moon going around the earth. That's uh, so basic now, we teach it in kindergarten, or whenever we teach it. Uh, but uh, but it, was a, it, was, it took Newton's genius to realize that. And it just kept going and going in the intervening 400 years. Electricity and magnetism. What do thunderbolts and uh, magnets have to do with each other? Nothing, obviously. And yet, we now understand the different aspects of the same thing. This kept going in a, in, a, in a deeper way in the beginning of the 20th century that started with these revolutions uh, of uh, relativity and quantum mechanics. Relativity told us that space and time were different aspects of the same thing. And uh, not only that, that, that this new unified pole, space-time, uh, was itself a dynamic arena. And, uh, and, and it could change. And the changes in space-time were associated with gravity. Unifying yet another thing that we talked about before that didn't seem to have anything uh, to do with the first two. Something even more revolutionary came along, the ideas of quantum mechanics. Um, and, uh, and quantum mechanics really changed everything. It's much more revolutionary than relativity. Um, uh, but it unified the ideas of particles and waves. There are things in nature that seem particle-like and things in nature that seem wave-like, which we understood to be different aspects of the same thing. It came at a significant cost. This old clockwork universe of Newton had to be abandoned. We now understand that we can't predict the future. Okay, well, the only thing we can predict are probabilities that this or that and the other can happen. But we can't have the same certainty of just predicting uh, the future if only we knew enough. Uh, the very idea of determinism is simply lost. Actually, uh, what, what we discovered is that the, the unifying thing is that there's actually no such things as waves. Everything in nature, everything in nature is a particle. There is no, um, uh, the, the, there's no feel-good unity between sometimes things are particles, sometimes things are waves. Everything's a particle. But they're quantum mechanical particles, not ordinary classical particles. And they behave in ways that are unusual uh, from the standard uh, Newtonian point of view. Now, those were the revolutions that started the 20th century. Um, but much of the rest of the 20th century was devoted to a synthesis of these two ideas. It is not always the time for revolution in physics. If only we knew ahead of time when it was time for revolution and time to be conservative, life would be a lot easier. If you always revolted, you would hand graduate students berets and send them to South America. Uh, if, uh, if it was always time to be conservative, you would, um, uh, well, I used to say you'd send them to the banks, but that's actually not true. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, we just don't know ahead of time uh, whether it's time to revolt or time to be conservative. Normally, it's time to be conservative. Uh, and normally the conservative ideas work. 
And the idea is to keep pushing the theories you have as far as they can possibly go, and often beyond the original places you thought they would work, until they truly break. So th this, is, this is the philosophy that keeps working again and again in this whole uh, 400 year period. So much of the rest of the 20th century didn't have revolutions. It was really taking the first revolution to relativity and quantum mechanics and figuring out how they played together. And, uh, and understanding how to talk about nature in a way that made both of those principles manifest. The general structure which accomplishes this is known as, uh, is something known as quantum field theory. And it has a number of really remarkable consequences. Um, one, of this, uh, one of the consequences of this basic unification of relativity and quantum mechanics is it forced on us the idea of antiparticles. There had to exist for every particle in nature uh, another particle of exactly the same properties, exactly the same mass, otherwise exactly the same properties, but opposite whatever charges the first particle had. So uh, if there are electrons, there have to be anti-electrons or positrons, which are equal in every way, but they have opposite charge. For protons, there have to be antiprotons and so on. And this is really amazing. It's a direct consequence of, of putting together the laws of quantum mechanics and the laws of relativity that doubled the world. And it was such a shocking prediction that the, uh, that the theorists uh, from whose equations these predictions came refused to make the prediction. It was too outlandish to imagine that we had missed half the world. But of course, uh, you know, good ideas are true whether or not the people who discover them know it. Uh, and uh, they were dutifully discovered by experimentalists uh, a few years after um, uh, uh, these ideas were uh, proposed. I want to give you just a flavor of why this is true, um, because it's a, it's, uh, it gives you an idea of why there's so much tension when we put basic principles of physics together, why there's tension and where these kind of remarkable predictions come from. Something probably many of you have heard of, uh, you don't need to follow the, 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 the real details here, you can get the, you can get the flavor easily enough. Something that probably many of you have heard of is that in, because of relativity, you can't go faster than the speed of light. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons for that is that uh, uh, here imagine time is marching up in this direction. Uh, this is a, a direction in space. And so imagine you're sending a signal here from A to B, uh, and it's going much, it's going faster than the speed of light. And so, it's, uh, so if it was going right at the speed of light and move along these green lines, but if it's going faster than the speed of light, it can actually get to B even faster. The sort of best thing would be if it hopped directly from A to B, it just went from there to there without taking any time at all. Okay, so I've drawn a slightly less exaggerated scenario. Well, what you learn from relativity is the reason that's not allowed to happen if some, is that someone else moving at high speeds uh, relative to the situation would then see that there's a signal going from A backwards in time to B. So that B uh, receives the signal before A sends it. A fires a gun to kill B. Someone else sees that B is dead before the gun was fired. That's impossible. So simple causality tells you that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And that's one of the tenets of the laws of special relativity. However, now quantum mechanics come, comes around. Quantum mechanics tells you that there's something called the uncertainty principle, that you don't know exactly where something is if you know exactly uh, where something is, you don't know uh, which direction it's moving in. Conversely, if you know what direction it's moving in, you don't know exactly where it is. That means there's always some tiny chance that A was really over here, it sent something that did make it to B, it didn't really go faster than light, but you're not sure. So there was some tiny chance that something like this really does happen. How can we possibly reconcile that with the idea of causality? Well, it's because all that's going on here is there's some, uh, let's say I'm sending an electron from A to B. Uh, there's some flow of electric charge forward in time from A to B. Here it seems very bad that there's a flow of electric charge, uh, negative electric charge from A to B backwards in time. But you can completely equivalently and causally think about what happened by declaring instead that there was a flow of positive electric charge forward in time from B to A. That's the only possible way you can rescue causality consistent with the laws of relativity and the laws of quantum mechanics. Okay. But that makes an immediate prediction. There had better be something out there which is a particle of positive charge that can move from B to A forward in time. That's why antiparticles have got to exist. There are some holes in this argument. Uh, this is a cartoon of the correct argument, but it's actually quite close to what the correct argument actually is. So you see, Putting together disparate laws forces surprising predictions, in this case, the existence of antiparticles. 
This has an immediate and remarkable consequence. The consequence is that um, what we normally think of as the most boring thing in the universe, namely emptiness, the vacuum, that even the vacuum is exciting. Why is that? Well, imagine you want to uh, check that some region of space is empty. Okay. So I'm sorry I'm a terrible artist. You have to suffer through that throughout this talk. Here is my version of a magnifying glass. Okay. <laughs> so uh, imagine you take a magnifying glass and you want to look at some region of space to check that it's empty. All right, that's, that's, that's very good. So uh, because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, to see what's going on in a small region of space, you have to put a lot of energy into that region. If you want to go to a smaller and smaller region, you've got to put more and more energy into that region. But at some point, you can put so much energy into the little region that you're looking at that nothing stops you from popping out a particle and an antiparticle. See, this would have been impossible if antiparticles didn't exist. But because antiparticles exist, I can conserve everything. Energy can be conserved, charge can be conserved. Just the act of putting the energy into the region is going to pop out a particle and an antiparticle. Okay. The act of trying to check whether a region of space is empty yields instead uh, a roiling mass of particles. So if you had a, a kind of boring picture of an electron sitting there, maybe with those electric field lines going out in space, that's actually wrong. As you get close to the electron, any measurement you would do on it would be consistent with the picture that there is a whole cloud of particles and antiparticles popping in and out around it all the time. And if we went to shorter distances, we would see heavier particles. Some of you haven't heard of maybe muons, charm quarks, anything there is in nature and it's anything would show up in an experiment when you go to uh, sufficiently short distances, just looking at the vacuum. We'll talk about uh, uh, we'll talk about the actual experiments that uh, that that probe this sort of physics. These are those giant accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider that we're going to be talking about. Sometimes these experiments are characterized as being the world's biggest microscopes. But you could ask, what are they looking at? They're not looking like at a little piece of hair or a paramecium or something. Okay? They're looking at the vacuum, They're taking snapshots of the vacuum. And because the vacuum is an exciting place, uh, you get a you get a different snapshot every time and you try to learn something about what's going on with the laws as you go to shorter distances. Now, all of these developments, uh, so we're nearing the end of our 400 years uh, review, all of these developments culminated in the, uh, in the mid-1970s with the invention of a specific quantum field theory, specific, uh, the, the, this general framework for making laws that are consistent with relativity and quantum mechanics is a big theoretical rubric, but a particular version of that turns out to describe the real world. And it describes all known interactions down to distances of around, at least 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. That's around 100 million times smaller than an atom, and it represents the smallest distances we've been to so far. And this theory is spectacularly successful. We don't screw around in physics when we say something is successful. Um, so. Uh, there are many consequences. For example, this 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 picture, these these things that look like metaphorical pictures. There's actually some teeth behind them. Uh, you can use them to calculate all kinds of effects, which are actually surprising uh, quantum mechanical effects. Effects of putting together quantum mechanics and relativity that change things in subtle ways from what you're used to. Um, for instance, uh, uh, because of this, uh, uh, because of, because of this effect, because of the fact that what surrounds an electron is this whole roiling mass of uh, particles and antiparticles, you can see if you're really far away, uh, you, you have an electron and, uh, and and you can't see this cloud of particles surrounding it. As you get closer and closer to the electron, you penetrate this cloud, and uh, and the fact that this electron has has, uh, has a negative charge is pushing away a little bit uh, the far away electron in the cloud, it's sucking in a little bit the, uh, the positrons in the cloud. So that means as you get closer and closer, you actually see a slightly bigger and bigger effective charge surrounding the electron. And it's a very subtle effect, and it's a small effect, but when, when you can measure, uh, the strength of the uh, electric force gets bigger. Okay. So, uh, so as, as you go down, uh, so as, as you go down, uh, as you go down to shorter and shorter distances, uh, you see a bigger and bigger effect of electric charge. This is something that's been measured and is, works exactly. Um, and there are many other consequences of this cloud picture. 
Um, there, are, there are certain properties of, of, of the electron. The electron spins like a top. That's, where, uh, that's why magnets work. Um, but once again, there are, there are small corrections to how quickly it's spinning that we can calculate to exquisite precision with this theory. Here's an example of one of these quantities. You don't have to know exactly what it is, but, uh, but I've written it out here to 12 decimal places. And I haven't bothered telling you whether that's the experimental or the theoretical result, because they, they agree to 12 decimal places. Okay. So these, this picture, putting together relativity and quantum mechanics in this way, is incredibly powerful, and it works. It describes the world. And uh, a remarkable thing that comes out of it is, is, a, uh, is an incredible unification. Uh, again, this idea of unification keeps going. Is an incredible unification of what seemed like very disparate and different interactions in nature. For example, we now understand that all the interactions, electromagnetism, the weak force, the strong force, gravity, everything, everything is associated with these little stick figures, stick figures invented by Richard Feynman. And well, they're all associated with the, so electromagnetism is the fact that electrons talk to photons through this little stick figure interaction. Uh, the weak force is associated with the fact that electrons and particles called neutrinos, you don't need to know what they are, I barely care what they are, uh, interact with something called the W particle, which I do care very much about. Uh, um, uh, the strong interaction is associated with the fact that quarks interact with other things called gluons. Um, protons and neutrons are, are, are not fundamental particles. We've known that for 50 years. They're built out of other things called quarks that are held inside the protons and neutrons by gluons. That we're called that imaginatively because they glue the quarks inside the proton and stop them from getting out. Um, similarly, interaction with gravity is that electrons talk to gravitons. Gravitons talk to each other. Gluons talk to each other. You see, the details are a little different, but everything is associated with little stick figures like this. And if you want to figure out how anything happens, all you have to do is string these stick figures together in a way that makes the process you're interested in. So let's say you want to know how two electrons bounce off each other. Well, just take that stick figure, copy it down twice so it makes it look like the electrons are bouncing off each other, and lickety-splat. Um, you then have to go to grad school for eight years, or, or uh, four years, five years. Uh, and, uh, and there is a specific mathematical expression that goes along with that and tells you what to do and how to, how to calculate it. And if you do it better and better and better, you get that kind of uh, 12 decimal place agreement between theory and experiment. Similarly, if you want to know how an electron and positron destroy each other and create a muon and an anti-muon, you do the same thing. Okay. Everything, all these interactions are associated with the same kind of stick figures. This is incredible. The apparent huge disparity between all these forces, electromagnetism, the weak force, the strong force, on the face of it, they look incredibly different. But we now understand the difference is a long-distance illusion. Really, fundamentally, at short distances, they're all described by exactly the same sort of stick figures. And it took us 2,000 years to figure that out, because that basic similarity only became evident finally at around 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. From the point of view of the fundamental physics that operates at short distances, everything looks the same. It's just, it just so happens that for, uh, for relatively accidental, detailed reasons, this screening effect that we were talking about, this effect we were talking about a second ago that I told you the strength of uh, electromagnetism gets a little bit stronger as you go to short distances, it turns out for quarks and the strong interactions, that strength gets a little bit weaker as you go to short distances. It's just uh, the sign could have gone either way. And uh, it turns out the strong interactions it goes one way or electromagnetism goes the other way. But that has a, the, a startling consequence that as, as you go to larger distances, the force between quarks gets bigger instead of getting smaller very, very gradually. But eventually, at distances around 10 to the minus 14 centimeters, the force gets so big that it stops quarks from getting out. That's why, that's why we couldn't possibly have seen that until we got down to 10 to the minus 14 centimeters. It's being hidden from us just because of this accident of long distance physics, long here being the size of the proton. So that's why, and, and similarly, uh, there are these stick figures associated with these weak interactions. Um, and uh, everything looks exactly the same, but it just so happens for another reason that, that we're going to try to learn more about in the coming years, uh, that, uh, that the particle associated with the weak interactions, 
called the W particle, happens to have a mass while the photon is massless. Because this particle has a mass, uh, once again, it's exactly the same sort of uh, units issue we were talking about before. It has a mass, so there's a typical uh, short length scale associated with it. It can't propagate very far by the uncertainty principle. And so the effects of the weak interactions only sh uh, are, are small. They're, they're, they're associated with, a, uh, with a, what to us as human beings looks like a short length scale of around 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. But if you went down to even much shorter distances than that, everything looks the same. They're not identical, but the rules, the basic rules, are exactly the same. Something that you might wonder is why everything is described by these little stick figures that only involve two guys, three guys at a time. Okay. Why don't we have much more complicated stick figures? If we had much, much more complicated stick figures like that, it would be sort of hopeless to figure out what's going on. Because, uh, uh, because we wouldn't just get to string these simple things together to get the answer to complicated problems. This, again, is a basic consequence of putting together quantum mechanics and relativity. If you imagine for a second, how might you have this? Remember, we talked uh, a little while ago that the strength of this uh, electromagnetic interaction, for example, was just a, a number, a small number, 1 over 137. Um, well, what kind of strength would this interaction have? If somehow I have to have a whole bunch of photons here talking to these electrons, then by the uncertainty principle, I have to pay many, many times the small chance that a photon appears there next to the electron. And that just means that uh, that's going to be harder and harder to do. The strength of that interaction is a small length scale to a, a big power. Uh, a length of the first power, second power, third power, the more and more photons I have there. So that's why if you're at sufficiently large distances, even if these things are there, they're going to be irrelevant. And the only ones that matter are the ones associated with these simple stick figures. So we even understand why it is that things necessarily will look simple. It's another basic consequence of putting together relativity and quantum mechanics. That whatever is going on at very, very short distances, at sufficiently large scales, they're guaranteed to be described by simple stick figures that you put together, and then you can make predictions for them. And so this is the menu that we have today. Uh, we don't need to go through this in any detail. We just need to know that this is a picture that tells you all the matter out there all the various uh, stick figures that go with it. Here are the strengths of all the various uh, interactions, the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions. All those things that looked incredibly different 50 years ago are now basically described by the same kind of <coughs> physics, by the same sort of stick figures, and even the strengths of the interactions are relatively similar. The strong force is a little bit stronger. It's a tenth. The electromagnetic force is 1 over 137. But they're not all that different from each other. And the important point is that they all look essentially similar. When I talk about this, I want to emphasize, so this is why we do this sort of physics. This is why we go to short distances. This is why we beg large governments to build giant accelerators. We do it not because we have some fetish for discovering new particles. It's because of this harder lesson over the last century. The harder lesson is that the essential unity, simplicity, and beauty of the laws of nature is hidden at large distances and is made apparent at short distances. We do these experiments to try to discover new particles, not because we care about the particles per se, but because the particles tell us a story about the underlying laws. Think about the particles as the alphabet. We're interested in the novel, and the novel is the laws. And, if it, and, and there was a dividend to, uh, to a doing this already. Um, uh, things that look vastly, vastly different only finally look similar when you go to sufficiently short scale, so you see them uh, nakedly, they want to be, before they're clothed by illusions at long distances. Okay. So there's one final question that we have left that we don't have a good answer to. Well, that we have an answer to, but we haven't verified experimentally. And sorry. We'll have plenty of time to talk about things we don't have a good answer to in a second. Uh, this is something we do have a good answer to, but which we're awaiting uh, to test by experiment. So I told you that any question about the everyday world that you might like to ask, we should have an answer to. So here's a very basic one. Why do things have mass? Um, particularly certain particles like the electron. The electron has a mass. That's very important. If the electron didn't have a mass, it would be whizzing around at the speed of light. There wouldn't be any atoms. We wouldn't be here to have this uh, discussion. Um, so 
We understand why electrons have mass um, because of the following picture. I apologize that this, that, uh, in, in, in all the years I've, I've talked about this, I've never managed to come up with a better uh, metaphor to explain this uh, to a general audience. It probably indicates that we still don't understand something as deeply as, uh, as we could. Um, but anyway, let me say the words, and then I'll uh, tell you why you'll complain, and I'll tell you why you shouldn't complain. <laughs> uh, so the words are that you should imagine that the universe is filled with some kind of, well, we call it technically a condensate. Uh, metaphorically, you might think of it as a kind of fluid. Instantly, you'll say, isn't that just like the ether? Didn't you guys learn anything 100 years ago from the ether? <laughs> Well, my answer is, it's a kind of fluid that it's not like the ether. <laughs> it's not like the ether because it looks exactly the same to observers moving at different velocities anyway. I told you it's a bad explanation. Okay? But, um, but uh, continuing with this not so good explanation, um, the reason things have mass is that as the electron would want to be whizzing along with the speed of light. Okay? But every now and then it bangs into this condensate. And this act of banging into it slows it down. And that's what gives it inertia. So that's why electrons have a mass. In the picture that works, that I told you about, the, the, uh, this is actually uh, the explanation. Other particles have a much bigger mass because they happen to have a much stronger interaction with this condensate. They bang into it much more frequently. Okay. The typical length scale between these collisions, which is a parameter in this theory that we can uh, extract from experiment, from other experiments, the, the typical length scale between these collisions is around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. So, Things have mass because as they move along, they're banging into this condensate every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters or so. That's where this length scale 10 to the minus 17 centimeters comes from. So things in our body, everything that's uh, the electrons in your body have a mass because every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, they're banging into this thing which is filling the entire universe. Okay. Now, People have known about this length scale, 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, for 70 years. We've known about it for a long, long time. We've understood it, or we think we've understood this picture even, for 40 years. We've understood these things for a long time. It's taken all that time for us to experimentally probe the distance of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. That's something which is so exciting. Um, uh, the, the Large Hadron Collider is about to probe exactly these very short distances. And we're not just saying it's exciting because it happens to be the frontier of where we are today. It is the frontier of where we are today. But it's also going somewhere that we've known about for a long time. Something interesting has got to be happening. Something interesting is happening around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And the thing that's, that, that, that makes atoms exist and uh, allows you and I to be in this room is the thing that's going to be uh, probed by this machine. Now, one of the... Uh, I should mention there are other particles that don't have any mass at all, like a photon, and that's because for very good reasons they simply don't interact with this condensate at all. Now the point is, when we collide particles with each other at very high energies, as we'll talk about uh, a little more, um, we necessarily put some ripple in this condensate. And the typical size of the ripple, the typical uh, wavelength of the ripple on this condensate is also around 10 to the minus 17. What that ripple looks like uh, is the production of a new particle. That particle is called the Higgs particle. So uh, this is something that many, many of you have probably heard about. But the Higgs particle is really nothing other than an excitation of this condensate, which, is, uh, which we think is responsible for the massive particles like the electron. That's something we have very good reasons to believe exists. I bet years of my salary that the Higgs exists. Um, and, uh, and hopefully I won't go to the poorhouse. But that's something that we can probably say. Okay, so that completes our review. Um, and now I want to tell you a little bit about the, the current frontier issues. Given the time, I think I won't be able to talk so much about this one. But let me tell you a little bit about it. So, um, so I mentioned right at the beginning that, uh, that we have very good reason to, to suspect that the idea of space-time is doomed. And, uh, so, going back to our picture of the scales, uh, that, just, that has to do with physics that we, we think is happening down near this Planck length, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Now, one thing that happens near 10 to the minus 33 centimeters is if you take, uh, let's say, a pair of electrons, uh, uh, a pair of electrons here at very, here in this room, if I took a pair of electrons and kept them this far apart from each other, the force of gravity between them 
is 10 to the 42 times weaker than the electrostatic, than the electric propulsion between. Gravity is a stunningly, stunningly, stunningly weak force compared to all the other forces. The only reason it's important, you know, keeps our feet on the ground and stuff like that, is because we happen to be made out of atoms that are neutral, and most of those electric forces cancel between positive and negative charges. Uh, but, uh, but otherwise, gravity is a ludicrously weak force compared to all the other forces. But something interesting happens, as you take this pair of electrons and you jam them, bring them closer and closer to each other, um, if you remember in school, again, both of these are inverse square law forces, so you would think uh, the ratio of the force doesn't change, but it actually starts changing, and gravity starts getting much, much stronger as you go to short distances, again, because of quantum mechanics. Uh, because of the uncertainty principle, if I'm bringing the electrons closer and closer together, I have to hold them there with more and more energy, but E equals mc squared. And that, uh, and that energy has mass, and the mass has gravity, and that makes, the, uh, that makes the gravitational force between the electrons bigger and bigger. So as you jam them closer and closer together, the force, the gravitational force between them starts ratcheting up. It has a long way to go, but it eventually catches up. It catches up at around 10 to the minus 31 centimeters. And if you go further to around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, the gravitational force is so strong that it wipes everything out. The strongest thing around. In fact, if we go back to my terrible magnifying glass, let's say we want to probe what's going on in some region of space time at very, very short distances. We have an infinitely generous government that gives us infinitely large accelerators, the best possible microscopes, uh, and we're going to just probe shorter and shorter distances. Okay. Well, once again, it's the same, same story over and over again. We have to put so much energy into such a small region of space. But we get to keep going. More and more energy, smaller and smaller distances. Nothing is wrong until we get to such short distances with such a huge amount of energy in that small space that because of gravity, we collapse the region we're trying to look at into a black hole out of which no information can escape. That happens around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So you're trying to figure out what's going on at very short distances, and you're stymied. You were trying to do it, and, and you couldn't anymore because a black hole is made that doesn't allow you to get any information from the little region you're trying to look at. Let's say you said, damn, I'll try harder. I'll build, build an even bigger accelerator. I'll put even more energy in. Well, what's going to happen? You're going to make an even bigger black hole. It's going to be even harder to see what's going on. In fact, at some point, if you, if you have gigantic energies, you'll have huge black holes. It'll be much worse than if you did nothing. Okay. So that tells us something very fundamental and deep. In a, in a real sense, there is no way of probing any distances in time smaller than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Okay. These things, there's simply no operational way of measuring them in any way. Every time this has happened to us in physics before, every time there's some concept, there's no way you can make an, even a thought experiment that could measure it. It's told us something important. It's told us that that concept is not fundamental. It has to be replaced by something else. It's, it's approximate. Okay. But in this case, the thing that's approximate is space-time. So something has got to replace space-time, but that's a, that's a pretty tall order. And these issues become, become very important uh, in places like the Big Bang. Okay. Uh, sometimes people ask, what happened before the Big Bang? Uh, it's a, uh, as far as we understand, it's a nonsensical question. Because as you approach the Big Bang, the very notion of space and time break down. So things like before simply don't have a meaning. We don't know what happens simply because we don't know what space and time mean anymore. Not because of anything else. Near the center of black holes, similar sorts of issues arise. And we just don't know. So that there it is, glaringly. In our theory as we have it, we simply can't make predictions for certain, for certain situations that we could easily imagine. But we simply don't know what is going on. Now, I won't have time to uh, talk about this, but this is, of course, what string theory is all about. And it was, and it remains, the, uh, the best set of ideas we have for attacking uh, this problem. Um, and uh, um, I won't have time to uh, talk about it. Um, but uh, we, will, uh, we will come back um, and uh, mention some of these things a, a little bit later. All right, let me mention um, the second set of problems. Um, and this is associated with the even more uh, burning set of questions, if you like. Uh, 
not so esoteric question to ask why the world is big. Um, but as I mentioned in the beginning, we don't have a good answer to that question. So here we're trying to understand uh, why there are these enormous uh, separations between the size of the universe, uh, this point length, and uh, the scale associated with mass that we just talked about, uh, called, uh, the weak scale. So it all has to do, once again, with this picture that the vacuum is exciting, that we've gone through a number of times already. But the difficulty is that it's far too exciting. A, a, a basic consequence of the fact that there are all these fluctuating particles and antiparticles all the time is that even the vacuum has energy. Uh, even something, here's a much, much uh, uh, more familiar example. Imagine just a ball hanging on a string. Uh, in, in a classical world, the ball would just hang on the string and it would just uh, hang on the bottom. And if you ask what's the smallest possible energy the ball could have, you would say, well, I don't know, it's zero. It's not moving, and it's just there at the bottom, and, and, and that's it. That's zero energy. But in a quantum mechanical world, you can't know for sure that it's right at the bottom. If you did know it's right at the bottom, then you'd have no idea how fast it's moving, how big energy. Okay. Uh, similarly, you can't know that it's not moving at all. So there's a, no matter what, no matter how you slice it, there's a minimum amount of energy that it must have. In fact, uh, there, there's a simple formula for it. If there, is, if there is a frequency for the oscillation of this pendulum, this minimum amount of quantum mechanical energy that it has is Planck's constant, the constant of quantum mechanics, multiplied by that frequency. So you see that energy that it has gets bigger and bigger if you have something with a bigger and bigger frequency. All right, so let's return to looking at, a, uh, to, to looking at the vacuum. So I want to see now how much energy is there in the vacuum. Let's look at a, a box here in the vacuum. Well, again, because of the uncertainty principle, uh, I can have fluctuations in this box. And the typical size of the fluctuations will be 1 over the size of the box. But in a smaller box, the fluctuations will, will have shorter wavelength, higher frequency. In an even smaller box, the fluctuations will have still shorter wavelength, still higher frequency. So once again, we're in the similar kind of soup we were before. Smaller and smaller boxes, bigger and bigger quantum fluctuations, more and more energy. There should be a gigantic amount of energy just in the vacuum from these quantum mechanical fluctuations. The energy, this energy in the vacuum has a name. It's called the cosmological constant. Um, we call it lambda, this is a Greek symbol. And we can come up with a nice uh, estimate for it. Uh, note that, the, that we're not talking about the total energy. The, the amount of energy, there should be some energy per unit volume of space here, 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 and here. There's no special point in space. So uh, we're talking about an energy per unit volume of space. So if you like, it's an energy density. And we can make an estimate for the energy density. I make the little box we're talking about. So it should be the energy in the quantum fluctuations in that box divided by the volume of the box. This is something that gets bigger and bigger as you go to shorter and shorter distances. But we just finished saying because space-time is doomed, well, so naively, uh, this is infinitely large. Okay? You would just make the box arbitrarily small, you have an infinite amount of energy density. That can't quite be right because we just finished this whole song and dance that space-time is doomed, etc., etc. Uh, the whole idea of, of space and time starts breaking down near this Planck length. So surely we can't talk about boxes that are too small compared to the Planck length. But we can get an estimate for how big this is. We're stopping somewhere around there. Let's stop somewhere around there to get an estimate for how big uh, that uh, energy density is. But we don't have to do any math, because the only word that appears is Planck. Planck length, Planck energy, Planck time, Planck, Planck, Planck. So the energy is Planck. Planckian. That's all you have to say. It's a Planckian energy density. Now, that would be perfectly fine, except for the fact that, uh, that Einstein tells us that energy and mass are the same, but mass gravitates, and the effect of this gravity is to curve space and time. So how curved would space and time be if you have this much energy density? Again, you don't have to know any math. The only word that makes an appearance is Planck. Once again, the strength of gravity is set by this Planck scale. So the words are Planck, Planck, Planck. So the curvature you would expect for space and time would be Planckian. That's really, really, really bad. Okay, because it would mean that we'd expect space to be curled up on distances of around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. 
Or, conversely, this kind of energy density in the vacuum could make the universe explosively expand, double in size at some uniform rate. In fact, double in size every, you guessed it, Planck time, every 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Neither one of these things remotely looks like our world. And yet this is what we get directly by this simple back-of-the-envelope estimate. In fact, we discovered in the uh, uh, late 1990s that our universe actually is accelerating. It is doubling in size at some uniform rate. But it's doubling in size every 10 billion years, not every 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Okay. The best explanation that we have for what would make the universe double in size at a uniform rate is that there is an energy density in the vacuum, is that there is this cosmological constant. But the size that we infer from this measurement is roughly 120 orders of magnitude smaller than what we just got from that back of the envelope estimate. I used to call this in talks the biggest error in the history of physics, and then I decided there's no reason to slander any of the other scientists. I don't think anyone has ever screwed up so badly. This is a 120 order of magnitude error. Okay. And, and this is really no joke, because as I told you, we're used in our part of science to exquisite precision and getting things right to 12 decimal places. And now here, this was the back of the envelope estimate. But any good theoretical physicist who's worth their salt will estimate anything correctly to a factor of two or three. We're not used to screwing up by 10 to the 120. So we take it personally. <laughs> so I told you that we have this spectacularly successful theory, we make all these incredible predictions, and yet we're getting this wrong by 10 to the 120. So what do we actually do? I mean, surely before we talk about these fancy things about how fast electrons spin and this and that, we better make sure that the universe isn't doubling in size every 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Right? So here's what we actually do. This is what we actually do. We say, no, there, there's no problem. There's no problem at all. There is, in fact, this energy density in the vacuum. Uh, that's what it's observed. What we just computed at the back of the envelope estimate was what you might call a quantum mechanical correction to this quantity. But there was also some classical piece that was sitting there already. And it just so happened that if this quantum correction that we just computed, let's say you, you gave it to a very smart graduate student or a team of graduate students, and you told them to sit there and calculate to, to the blue in the face, and they computed it. Here it is in Planck units for fun. 2.649378, dot, 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 dot. They, they, they're very, very good. So they calculated to 130 decimals. They got tired and they stopped at 120. Okay. Then you say, ah, oh, it just so happened, guess what? It just so happened that that classical piece was negative 2.649378, dot, 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 dot. And they agreed for 120 decimal places, and they began to disagree in the 121st decimal place. That's what we actually do. Now, it, it works. We're allowed to do it. Uh, and if we do that, uh, we can then proceed and calculate all these other things, and we get all these other things spectacularly correct. Okay. But this is what we have to do to, to answer an incredibly basic question like, why is the universe big? And it seems wrong. <laughs> For obvious reasons, this is called fine tuning. <laughs> and. Um, it's a really good thing that intelligent designers don't really care about physics. <laughs> because uh, uh, this, is really, this, is, this, is really, this is really a case where it appears that there is some incredible conspiracy in the basic concept of physics uh, to a part in 10 to 120. And we don't really have a good understanding for why it's happening. Uh, fortunately, they just don't want us to be monkeys. Uh, but uh, so that they don't care too much about the cosmology. But uh, but this is a really serious, really serious puzzle that at the moment we don't have, we don't know the correct answer to. Okay. It's called fine tuning because it's like walking into a room and seeing a pencil standing on its tip in the middle of a table to within ten to the minus one hundred and twenty degrees of vertical. It's possible. It doesn't contradict any laws of nature for that to be the case. But if you saw something like that happen, you might probably think something is up. <laughs> Maybe look for a string hanging from the ceiling. Okay. And you think about it. Now, it turns out that virtually exactly the same issue arises in trying to understand the question of 
uh, of um, uh, why the scale associated with the origin of mass is, um, is, is what it is. Okay. Uh, this condensate we're talking about can, should also be fluctuating violently quantum mechanically. So we would expect, because of those gigantic fluctuations in quantum fluctuations in this condensate, that the electron as it's moving around is going to bang into this thing, not every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, but every 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's, again, what we'd expect from this kind of back of the envelope estimate. And that's, again, wrong, rather drastically wrong. Okay. In order to explain the 10 to the minus 17 centimeter scale uh, instead, uh, we have to, in the theory we have right now, uh, finally adjust parameters not to an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 120, but an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 30. It's not as bad as the first one, but it's still horrible. And this is, uh, if this didn't happen, the electron would be incredibly more massive, all the particles would be incredibly more massive, you and I would all be black holes, it would be a very unpleasant universe. So these are not uh, esoteric egghead questions. Why is the universe big? Why aren't we all black holes? Uh, are you know, reasonable questions that, that science should have an answer to. And the current theory that we have, as spectacularly successful as it, as it is, has an answer. The answer is we finally adjust parameters to a total, a combined accuracy of one part in 10 to the 150. But it seems like that answer is so ludicrous that we're missing something big and that uh, uh, we should think about. So that's, that's the question. What is it that controls these violent quantum fluctuations in the vacuum? Why is there a macroscopic universe at all? So if I can just take uh, um, 10 more minutes, I will uh, try to, uh, to uh, uh, tell you uh, the rest of the story. Well, what it could be um, uh, is that something has got to change the rules. We have to remove these huge quantum fluctuations in the vacuum. Uh, we just have to change this picture. It can't be that as you go to shorter and shorter distances, these quantum fluctuations get bigger and bigger and bigger. Just That can simply not be the case. And furthermore, the rules have got to change right here around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. That's, uh, uh, otherwise, if we would all be black holes, it would be a disaster. In other words, if the rules change around 10 to the minus 24 centimeters, uh, not 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, well, very good. The fluctuation would get gigantic and keep sailing past 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. It would still be bad. It doesn't matter that it has to go all the way down to 10 to the minus 33. It just matters that if it goes much smaller than 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, we have a terrible understanding for why uh, uh, we, we, we can't understand um, uh, why all the particles are much, much more massive than, than they are. So this says that something relatively drastic has got to come in and change the rules around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. The new thing can't just be a dinky particle or two. The new thing has got to change the rules sufficiently to remove this problem, which, as I've emphasized several times, is a direct consequence of the picture we have of space-time from Einstein, relativity, and quantum mechanics. So what could it be? Well, in this pencil analogy, um, it could be that, that if you look closely enough, you find a little hand holding up the pencil. <laughs> there is some mechanism that's actually stabilizing it. That these big fluctuations aren't really there. But since the problem originated directly from our combination of space-time and quantum mechanics, it stands to reason that whatever solves it should uh, change those rules in some way. This is a great problem. It's been around for around 30 years. Good problems fight back. It's hard to solve them. And in these 30 years that people have been talking about it, there's essentially one or two, essentially two, uh, broad approaches that even theoretically make sense, never mind if they're realized in nature, but even conceptually, theoretically, make internal mathematical sense. And all of them, in one way or another, involve an extension to our notions of space time. So that's one of the things that we're really eagerly anticipating. The best such idea is known as supersymmetry. Uh, this would take uh, a little too long to explain uh, in, in, in detail, but as you get down to sufficiently short distances, um, the idea is that in addition to our ordinary dimensions of space, there are additional dimensions. Now, a, a lot of you have probably heard of uh, uh, extra dimensions of space, but the sort of extra dimensions that are that, that uh, 
that are commonly discussed in, uh, in, in popular books and so on are relatively boring things. They're just like our own dimensions, but uh, they're curled up or something like that. But if you're a sufficiently small ant, you would uh, wander around and it wouldn't look, those dimensions wouldn't look too, too different than ours. They just happen to be curled up. But there's another kind of dimension that we could have that's much more conceptually interesting. Um, and we have actually circumstantial belief, reasons to believe that it's correct. Uh, these are extra dimensions where the measurement of the distance, so to speak, in those dimensions isn't by ordinary numbers, but by more quantum mechanical versions of numbers. You know, ordinary, uh, ordinary distances are measured in meters or whatever kind of units you want to measure them in, but they're ordinary numbers. They have the property that if you multiply A times B, you get B times A. A times B is equal to B times A. But the distance in these quantum dimensions are measured by other kinds of numbers, which have the property that A times B is negative B times A. That's something we learned was possible, in fact, natural in quantum mechanics. Now, if A times B is equal to negative B times A, in particular, A times A is equal to zero, because it's negative itself. Uh, so that means that you can't take more than two steps in this quantum direction. So all that can happen, if you have a particle moving around in our direction, it could also wander around in the quantum direction. It can take sort of one step in the quantum direction. It can't take two steps in the uh, quantum direction. And it, when it takes that one step that it can take in the quantum direction, it looks in our own world like another particle, very similar properties to ours, but only a slightly, but some detailed properties are different. Something called the spin of the particles is different. But Otherwise, there's perfect symmetry between what's going on in our world and in these quantum dimensions. This turns out to be a theoretically quite deep idea. As I said, we have circumstantial reasons for believing that it's true. But uh, amongst other things, it solves this problem. It, it, it modifies the notion of space-time in a sufficiently novel way that it removes completely these violent quantum fluctuations of uh, it, these violent quantum fluctuations at very short distances. The reason is very simply that as you go to small enough scales, around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, you start seeing these quantum dimensions. You're trying to fluctuate in the ordinary dimensions more and more and more violently, but there's supposed to be a perfect symmetry between what's going on in our dimensions and in these quantum dimensions. However, it's impossible to fluctuate in the quantum dimensions. You can't even take more than two steps of them, never mind go back and forth wildly. So the only way this can be consistent is if the fluctuation is removed altogether. The effects of these quantum dimensions are to wipe out completely these violent quantum mechanical fluctuations that gave rise to all the trouble we had to begin with. So, as I said, there are some circumstantial reasons for believing that this picture is true, but uh, I won't have time to uh, talk about that. All right, so let me um, uh, finally move on to what we might learn from uh, experiment now. So, uh, and really, all of our hopes and dreams uh, lie uh, with this uh, uh, wonderful machine that's uh, going to probe these ideas. So, this is an aerial picture of the, uh, 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 of, the uh, uh, of an area just outside Geneva. Um, there's the Swiss-French Alps in the background. And of course, from, uh, if you look down from the air, you don't see this big red oval on the ground. <laughs> um, but underneath that red oval, um, deep underground, um, but underneath where, where the oval is, uh, is where this uh, uh, experiment uh, takes place. So the oval is around 27 kilometers around. And inside it, uh, we, and uh, this we here is my experimental colleagues who do all the work, uh, we accelerate protons. Um, protons, one set of protons go around the ring one way, another set of protons whiz around the, wing the, other, uh, the ring the other way. We make them go really, really, really fast and smash them into each other at a few places around the ring and study what comes out. Okay. So this is what it looks like uh, in the actual tunnel. So the protons are, are in there. You see 27 kilometers around, so the ring is 27 kilometers around. 27 kilometers is pretty big. So you can barely detect its curvature from the inside. You just see it sort of bending around. Uh, this is uh, uh, not only is it a spectacular experiment scientifically, it's uh, 
It's uh, big science on the largest scale I think we've ever seen. Um, there's roughly 5,000 people working on this experiment. And they really are come from all around the world. The U.S. has a very significant, uh, has a very, very significant representation in it, despite the fact that the experiment is happening in Europe. And so here's a theorist picture of what's going on uh, at this machine. So we take a proton again. Here's a proton. There's a proton. We accelerate them to 0.9999999 times the speed of light um, and smash them into each other. With that much, uh, with, with that much of velocity, they have an, an energy which is around 7,000 times their own mc squared energy. So they're going as incredibly fast. Now, if I take my magnifying glass and I look at the proton, I see that it's uh, it's a bag. It's made out of these quarks and gluons that I mentioned before. Okay. Most of the time, what happens when you smash these protons into each other is that these bags just disintegrate. They break apart, and the debris of the collisions goes this way and it goes that way. They're moving so fast that the debris just goes in the direction that the two beams are going in to begin with. Okay. That's what happens the vast majority of the time. And it's what we're not interested in. Some people are interested in actually, but it's not what we're interested in for the purposes of, of this talk. What we're interested in, the whole reason we're doing this, is we want to look for head-on collisions. And these head-on collisions between the underlying fundamental particles, the head-on collisions are probing very, very short distances, again, because of the uncertainty principle. So what we want to happen is to have these underlying quarks and gluons bang into each other. And we know that happens because if they, if they had suffered this really head-on collision, the things that come out will come out at a very large angle relative to the beam. Okay? They're not just breaking apart. Okay? They're having this big head-on collision, so something drastic happens. So we look for things that come out at relatively big angles uh, to the beam, whereas most of the debris is just going up and down in a direction. Now, that something new happens, uh, hopefully, is going to happen at a distance of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And the new things will typically be in the form of new particles. As I said, we don't care about the particles per se, but we care about the story they have to tell us about the underlying laws. Unfortunately, the new particles don't come out wearing a name tag, I'm a new particle. In fact, what they typically do is decay very rapidly in a time of order 10 to the minus 27 seconds. That's how long it takes light to travel 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. They decay back to ordinary particles. Ordinary particles like electrons, anti-electrons, muons, uh, some of these quarks, which as they travel in space, uh, uh, pick up uh, other quarks from the vacuum and turn into things that are called jets of uh, strongly interacting particles. But what we then do is capture all of these things that came out uh, and study them in as much detail as possible to see if we can reconstruct from the properties of these things that came out what it is that happened at these very, very short distances. Okay. That's, that's the strategy. You might think it's ironic that uh, this experiment that's designed to probe the shortest distances we've ever seen is the largest physical experiment that's ever been built by humanity. Okay. And this is once again an ode to quantum mechanics. It's because of the uncertainty principle, again and again. We need these giant energies to go to short distances. That's why we need these huge rings okay, to accelerate the particles, give enough time to accelerate them, and, uh, and send them to these really high energies. And also, because these particles are coming out, or whizzing out incredibly high energies, we have to surround them by huge detectors just to stop them. Just to, just to have enough space to stop them and to study their properties. And so the detectors that we surround these collision regions are the biggest scientific instruments that have been, ever been built by humanity. So here are the ones that, uh, uh, that, there are two that we care about particularly. Here's one of the detectors, it's called the Atlas detector. And this is, a, uh, this is a, a cartoon of what it looks like. It's around 24 meters tall, 45 meters uh, wide. There are a couple of grad students. <laughs> uh, and you don't have to go through this in, uh, uh, in any detail. You just get, get, get the picture. That it's, like, it's like the whole onion of detectors surrounding the collision region. Some collision happens in there, and the particles come whizzing out, and they're stopped in various ways by all of this hunk of material surrounding it. And you try to reconstruct from what came out what it is that happened at those tiny distances. So 
this is a, this is this is a, this is again what, what it might look like. So so the, so something happens in here. But this whole spray of particles come, comes out, and uh, and you you capture them in various places around the detector, and uh, try to learn about what happened. This is uh, an actual picture of what the Alice experiment looked like before everything was, was closed up and uh, things were running. Uh, there was a person down, down, down here. Oops. Um, and uh, again, a sense for the scale, uh, the massive scale of these, uh, of these wonderful detects. And the amusing fact about the Alice detector is if you put it in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it would float. It's got a lot of air in it, despite the fact that it's, uh, it's so big. There are two experiments, uh, um, two sets of the detectors uh, doing this kind of physics at the LHC. It's always a good idea to have two teams competing. Um, and the other one, uh, this is a picture of the other one. Um, Davis has some significant representation in this uh, experiment. Um, uh, this is called uh, uh, CMS. The C stands for compact. It's a compact dream on See, it's so small compared to the other one. <laughs> um, it's not that small. This one would not float. And again, there's a, there's a person down there. Um, and, uh, I mean, I could give an entire talk about the, the technological wonders of these, uh, of these, of these detectors. Uh, if you go close enough in, for example, there are these wonderful layers of silicon that, uh, that surround the, the place where the collisions take place. That's really like a very, very fancy digital camera that, that takes extremely, exquisitely detailed, uh, keeps an exquisitely detailed track of, of all the charged particles that are coming out. And later, of course, many other things happen throughout the rest of the system. And again, to get an idea of, of how big these things are, this is, this is a picture of the uh, experimental cavern in 2004 where the CMS detector now sits. Okay, so um, uh, that's the ground up there. And uh, this gadget was lowered very, very slowly <laughs> through that hole uh, to sit down at the bottom. All right, now let's get back to my pictures. Um, so the reason we do this is to probe physics at these very short distances because we expect something dramatic to happen. Let's say that dramatic thing was supersymmetry. How would it show up? Well, as we collide these protons in, into each other, uh, remember supersymmetry with, that if we go to short enough distances, we see these new quantum dimensions at around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And the way that shows up is that when we collide these protons uh, uh, into each other at sufficiently high energies, the quarks in them will have suffer one of these head-on collisions and have enough energy to jump off into these quantum dimensions. When they jump off into these quantum dimensions, from our point of view, they're described by new particles. Unfortunately, these particles were given silly names in the 70s. Um, they were called squarks, the super partner of quarks. But uh, regardless of the name, uh, these things decay incredibly rapidly, extremely rapidly, uh, into ordinary particles. So here's a cartoon for what could happen. This quark decays into a quark and a partner of the photon that's called the photino. This one on this side decays to a quark and a partner of the W particle called the wino, which, uh, or well, let's not call it the wino, <laughs> uh, which in turn decays to a, a positron and an anti-selectron, which decays to an electron and, and a photino, and so on. So it can look different on both sides. There's a whole complicated chain of events that can take place. An interesting thing is that on both sides here, we end with this photino, which is what happens when the photon travels in the uh, quantum mechanical dimensions. And that has a rather characteristic striking signal. There should be energy missing from the event. Because these particles are neutral, they're very weakly interacting, they sail right through these giant detectors, and they just look like missing energy. So this is what it could look like, for example, in Atlas. This is a simulation of what supersymmetry, one of these events, would look like. You see, quite clearly, there's something missing here. <laughs> and that's really what it should look like. You make some particles, some of them come out, and then everything is going that way. Well, what happened? What happened to these laws of conservation of momentum and things like that that we learned about in school? Well, there are some of these uh, missing particles that must be recoiling against them and going in the opposite direction. That's a very characteristic kind of signal uh, that would be associated with the supersymmetry. 
And then uh, all the rest of these particles would also have them particular properties. And with lots and lots of work, you could try to reconstruct what it was that actually happened to figure out the story. Uh, the one thing that, as I mentioned, we really expect to see um, uh, for sure is the haze. And it's a similar story, again. Uh, so the, the proton comes along, the other proton comes along. This time, the sort of main way, one of the main ways we expect to see the haze at the LHC is that the, the gluons in the proton come along and pop out of the vacuum uh, uh, some of the particles that, that, that have very big interactions with the Higgs that I mentioned. The sort of biggest one of all is something called the top quark. And um, this will then produce out of the vacuum, this whole procedure will produce out of the vacuum a Higgs particle. Once again, the Higgs doesn't come out and say, I am a Higgs. Uh, it uh, very rapidly disintegrates into ordinary particles. And I, and I just want to tell you, just to, to give you a flavor of some of the challenges that are involved in this, uh, in this kind of physics, uh, what does Higgs want to do almost all the time um, for, for at least one particularly plausible uh, a range of, uh, uh, of one, one particular plausible sort of Higgs um, is to decay to another kind of quark called bottom quarks. That's what it does almost all the time. 99.9% of the time, it decays into bottom quarks. And that's just too darn bad for us because this process, even though this is what happens all the time, is impossible to see. The reason is that other processes make bottom quarks far more efficiently. And so we're completely swamped by what you, you might call a background of bottom quarks made by other processes that we don't care about. <coughs> so we don't quit. What you have to do instead is, is realize that around one every thousand times, the Higgs will decay another way. It'll decay to a pair of photons instead of a pair of bottom quarks. That happens from other processes much, much more rarely. So despite the fact that it's not remotely the main thing that this guy does, you just have to wait long enough for it to happen like this and try to find it like that. And this is an example, again, of a simulation of what a Higgs event would look like uh, at, at, at the LHC. And you really have to work very hard. These are needles in haystacks, but you have to know what you're looking for and and uh, where to look. And there, there are ways of convincing yourself that the two photons that you've seen are actually coming from a haze and not from some uh, random other underlying <coughs> process. If you make this, uh, if you make this Higgs particle, it always has the same mass no matter what you do. So that means that the two photons that are coming out, the energies that they have, have to add up to the same mass all the time. So while random processes will just give you photons with sort of random energies distributed here and there, Every time you make the Higgs, it's going to come out with exactly the same energies, over and over. So you should, you should expect, if you, if you look at all the photons you have, and you see the energies uh, that those photons have, there should be a spike where the Higgs is. And that's the sort of thing you look for. That spike is to be expected from producing this particle, and not to be expected from just randomly making photons from other processes. But this is the sort of thing that uh, is going to have to be done. Uh, this is a plot that, uh, uh, it's not a plot, it's a cartoon that my experimental colleagues will hate me for um, uh, because uh, it drastically oversimplifies uh, how hard their life is. Um, but, uh, uh, but this is roughly speaking how we're going to discover and convince ourselves that we're seeing some, something new. Just to give you an idea of the rates at which things happen. So, uh, so here is a, uh, as a function of energy of any measure of energy of the particles coming out, imagine looking at the number of events you have. And uh, what we expect is from standard processes, none of this fancy new stuff, from standard processes, uh, as we go to higher and higher energies, the rates should go down with energy. It's a simple, basic uh, unit's consequence of what we talked about before. But if there's some new physics up there at uh, higher masses and higher energies, uh, even though this is the vast majority of what happens, there should be a little bump out there associated with the new physics. So the reason we have a hope of extracting it is because uh, there's a, there should be a characteristic scale associated with it. While most things are just going down, down, down as you go to higher energies, somewhere we should expect a bump. Just to give you an idea of how big a needle in a haystack this is, uh, here are the kind of rates we're talking about. There's roughly one billion collisions per second. Um, there are roughly 10 top quarks made every second. 
Now, top quarks uh, were, were discovered that the previous biggest experiment, um, uh, biggest accelerator in the world outside Chicago, uh, Fermilab, it was a tour de force experimental discovery. Now, 14 of them were discovered in the year 1995. It's a, it's a truism in this, uh, in this business that yesterday's discovery is, uh, is today's calibration is tomorrow's background. Uh, and so what took, what, took, uh, what took heroic effort in the mid-90s, 10 of them would be made every second at the LHC. But even that's not new anymore. We're interested in, these, uh, in things like supersymmetry. And the rate for making particles like squarks is like one a minute. That's a pretty decent rate. But you have to extract that off these things that are vastly bigger and are coming from ordinary physics. And the only reason you have a hope is because we can characterize this pretty well, and we're looking for something that should stick up uh, over, the, uh, over these falling backgrounds. Okay. So let me finish up um, by, uh, by talking about what we might know by 2020. First of all, um, one thing that people often ask is, could it be this machine sees nothing? And the answer is, it cannot be that it sees nothing. And it's not just because uh, we would be disappointed and so on. Um, in a specific sense, uh, if there's really nothing out there, I mean, I'm putting aside the chance that it might be hard to see and difficult to discover. I mean, if there's really nothing new out there, then something much more radical than everything I'm talking about would be true. The laws of quantum mechanics would have to be wrong and would have to be modified. Um, I don't have time to uh, explain this, but something absolutely must happen. Something, in particular, like the Higgs boson, must exist in order, to, in order for quantum mechanics to be consistent. There's absolutely no reason to suspect that quantum mechanics is going to break down. Um, there's no reason to break, for it to break down here, which is why we're so sure that something like the Higgs is going to be there. So I, I think this is simply impossible. Something, something beyond what we've seen is going to show up. Now, uh, if we see supersymmetry, or something like it, I think that would be euphoria. Uh, and uh, I think this is one of the most exciting possible outcomes. It happens it would be the first time we've had an extension to our notion of space-time since Einstein. Uh, and on top of that, it would give us an explanation. Uh, it would give us a good answer to the question of why, uh, why gravity is so much weaker than all the other forces. There wouldn't be any major fine-tuning. There would be a mechanism. There would be the little hand holding up the pencil. And the hand holding up the pencil would be associated with something rather dramatic, this extension to our ideas of space time. Indeed, the first one in the century. Okay. I didn't have time to, uh, oh, something I didn't have time to mention is that there, there's another set of motivations to expect something new at exactly these energy scales. It has to do with a completely different branch of the science, our science. It has to do with cosmology. And the fact that astronomers have told us for 50, 60 years that most of the mass of the universe is not particles we know and love, but it's some kind of dark matter. And there are very good reasons to expect that this dark matter has a mass in the neighborhood of what we're uh, just about to probe with the LHC. In fact, if supersymmetry is correct, dark matter could very well be light moving in the quantum dimensions. These uh, super partner of the photons, photino particle, is a very good candidate for the dark matter of the universe. And so it could be by 2020 that the LHC would be a dark matter factory. Uh, and we'd, we'd be producing millions of them and studying their properties just in the lab in, uh, in, in, in real detail. Now, uh, something I had no time to talk about um, is the fact that these great explanations we have uh, or these great ideas involving uh, uh, supersymmetry, still leave rather mysterious that even bigger problem that we started talking about, the problem of the energy of the vacuum, this 10 to the 120 order of magnitude problem. Um, this is something we still don't have a very good explanation for. And the only good, reasonable, vaguely reasonable scientific explanations that we have for them involve a whole other set of ideas and topics that would take me an entire other talk to discuss but which invoke the idea that we might actually be, uh, our entire observable universe might be a very tiny speck in a vastly larger multiverse. And the properties of, of, of the particles and the things like the energy of the vacuum, things like uh, all these parameters associated with the Higgs and so on, could vary from place to place to place in this multiverse. And most of the places in this multiverse would be lethal, would be impossible for, would just be empty, there would be nothing there. 
accidentally in a few places, these accidents happen. These 10 to the 120 order of magnitude accidents happen. And those places simply aren't empty. And just by the virtue that those are the only places in this vast multiverse that aren't empty, that's where we're going to find ourselves. Um, that's a sort of explanation that's often called anthropic reasoning. It's misunderstood as placing human beings in the center of everything. It's quite, as you see, quite, quite the contrary. It means that we're even, even more insignificant than we ever thought before. Um, the vast majority of the universe is completely lethal and cares so little about our existence that it barely made this minuscule amount of room for us to be there. And we're only going to find ourselves in the places where it's possible. Uh, that's a kind of, uh, of argument that makes many, many physicists very, very uncomfortable. Um, but so far, we don't have a better explanation for the smallness of this uh, energy density of the vacuum. Even supersymmetry, the spectacular idea, um, which we have so many reasons to believe is, is true, is not enough to um, solve that problem. So if we don't see at the LHC, if we don't see any evidence for something like, something like supersymmetry, something that holds up the hand of the pencil, then I think we're in a very, very confusing situation. But um, we might have to start taking this picture a little more seriously, because we wouldn't have another scientific alternative at that point. So the stakes are really very high. Uh, you would have appreciated how, how high they are if I had uh, real time to talk about this uh, alternate picture. But we're really balanced between a picture of order versus chaos. Uh, a picture that there are beautiful, deep, uh, uh, extensions of our notion of space-time, like supersymmetries that are controlling things, versus the picture that really there is a totally different radical change of our notion of space-time at very, very large distances. Way out there somewhere in the multiverse, things are different, and we only happen to live in the region where it's possible for us to exist. These are completely radically different pictures for what, uh, for what the uh, uh, universe looks like, what the laws of nature looks like, and we are really balanced on this precipice today. We don't know for a fact which way things are going to break. And what we learn from the LHC is going to send us hurtling in one direction or the other. So the stakes are very, very high. But uh, um, I hope I've, I've convinced you that there's something important and exciting going on here, and that uh, we will have some definite answers uh, in this decade. And please stay tuned. Um, uh, I've given, my colleagues have given many talks of this sort over the last 10 years. And it's, it's extremely exciting that, uh, that we don't have to keep talking about it. It's, it's now happening. The machine is on. Um, it's taken data. Um, and, uh, and many of us are waiting with bated breath for the, for the first uh, set of analyses uh, to come out. Um, uh, and uh, I think relatively soon we'll have some real answers to these questions. And instead of telling you what we think, we'll tell you what we know. Thank you very much. Question. I understand, I've read a little bit, there's an elaborate system for analyzing petabytes of yes, data yes. that are coming out of yes. this experiment. And if you could talk a little bit about what that elaborate system is and, and who might be the one to see the, the, uh, the big deal. You might want to talk to some of the people who are right here in the audience, right there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, do you, do you wanna, I mean, I'm happy, I'm happy to say something, but I really defer to my colleagues who are there. Do you want, you want to say something? There are indeed petabytes of data. Yeah, and there are thousands.
we're still not out of the woods yet. Yes, that's that's true. But it's not as dark <coughs> as this other alternative. Well, I mean, dark or not, we're in the truth business. Uh, right. So, um, uh, uh, I think what's 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 true. I, I, I really I really didn't mean to have any uh, any. Um, uh, any value judgment on these two, two right. pictures? Yeah, it's fine. One, one or the other is, is, is true, um, uh, or perhaps neither. But um, <laughs> but it's true. Like if supersymmetry is correct, then a certain approach um, to understanding these things, in terms of invoking more symmetries, deeper laws, and so on, uh, will be shown to be correct. Uh, I, I didn't have time to emphasize this in this talk, but this sort of issue, this kind of naturalness issue, this sort of fine tuning issue, has come up three. Or, actually three times in the last century. Uh, in the 20th century, this sort of issue arose three times. Every single time its answer was something along the lines of you discover the hand holding it up. Okay. Every single time you could have freaked out, said, oh, what's going on? There's some conspiracy. And every single time there was, uh, there was something that, that came along and there was a hand holding it up. In fact, the most dramatic example was roughly 100 years ago. 100 years ago, classical physicists were, were really extremely confused because they had this picture of the, of the point-like electron. Uh, and they saw that there was the electric field that surrounded the electron. They could compute the amount of energy in that electric field. And the energy in that electric field was infinite. Exactly the same kind of infinity that we're talking about here. So they were very, very confused. Something new had to come in. Or there had to be some massive conspiracy. Okay? Well, one or the other. Something new had to come in. Uh, and the new thing that came in was, in fact, positrons, quantum mechanics, relativity. The whole story actually solves that problem. In fact, it solves it precisely because of all these, because instead of having the picture of the point-like electron, when you get close enough to it, you see this roiling cloud of electrons and positrons that actually completely cancels the effect. And a couple of more times, slightly less dramatic examples, but a couple of more times, that sort of thing came up, and the answer again and again was a new symmetry, a new principle, something comes in, you know. Then so, so, um, uh, so there's sort of, a, there's a track record for this sort of argument working. On the other hand, it's very disturbing that uh, while we have a good explanation for this sort of second 10 to the 30 order of magnitude problem, we still don't have a good explanation for the cosmological constant problem. And it could be, it could be that that's just a very different problem and we're still not thinking about it right, and it's not the correct time to solve it. Or it could be that, in fact, uh, uh, there's a unified explanation of both of these things and we have to take this sort of multiverse picture much more seriously. But could proving supersymmetry give you an answer to that next question? Uh, I, I, you know, um, uh, science is filled with wonderful surprises that happen when things are going well. Okay. Um, and when, 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 when things are going well, more things come out than, than you put in, and, uh, and, and things move, because you're, right, you're asking the right question, you have the right sort of data. So I, I, um, there may well be something of that sort, once we actually see the way nature implements supersymmetry, that might give us a much better idea of some mechanism that might be at work to solve the first problem. But at the moment, none of us have come up with such an idea. Okay. And so it would really have to be a surprise from my experiment, even if it was supersymmetry. If many of us have been operating on the assumption that it will be supersymmetry, but even in that context, uh, no one has found uh, an, an explanation yet for that first bigger problem. Yes? So if you want to see closer to the point that you particles, do you need to have, if you swap out the, the sensitivity of the detector, if you want to see closer to the point point of the of, of, uh, particle, do you swap out the sensitivity of the detector, or do you add more power, or do you increase the mass of the entire experiment? Uh, really, all you need to do to, uh, all, all you need to do to probe shorter distances is, uh, is just fire things head on into each other at higher and higher energies. Okay? So, in, in, so, uh, now, you need a certain good amount of energy, because this guy's got to come in with a Planckian energy, that guy's got to come in with a Planckian energy. But just one of those collisions alone, in principle, probe was going on down, down at the Planck level. There's much more that's going on in actual practical experiments, because we want to do this uh, many, many times. So you don't just take one particle, you take big bunches of particles. Now you want to take big bunches of particles and have them smashing into each other at uh, high enough energy, so that something new happens often enough so that you, you don't have to wait around forever. Until you uh, till you discover what, what, what's going on. Okay. So even way before getting to the Planck length, even down at the distances that we're probing with the LHC, these bunches of protons, not just one of them that are being fired, it's a whole bunch of them being fired into each other. The total amount of energy in one of those bunches is like uh, is an aircraft carrier moving at 20 knots or something. Okay. 
So never mind getting up to the Planck, <laughs> getting up to the Planck energy, which would also take a, a, an accelerator as big as the galaxy. Uh, so, uh, but, but conceptually, all you need to do is fire two particles into each other, um, fire them into each other, and energy is comparable to the Planck energy, and they will probe what's going on at the Planck level, whether you like it or not, and whether you can extract information from it. So just for fun, one cycle of this firing takes up about how much energy, like. Uh, well, that, 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 that's, that's what I said. One of these bunches of protons is like a, a big aircraft carrier moving as fast as it can. One of these bunches. So is that like a significant part of the electrical grid of... of uh, it certainly is. Well, in, 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 uh, of Geneva, yes, it is. Yes. The, the, the electricity bill is significant. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and by the way, I mean, there, there's a huge number of practical data. It's very, very important that this thing doesn't, you know, accidentally not go around in a circle and go in a straight line, right? <laughs> that would do very, very significant damage to the, uh, to, to, um, to, to the machine. That's why it's underground. That's why it's underground. Yeah. 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 Y
You said that during your presentation that you speed up particles to really Where, where are you? Why am I in the water? Oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> So you said during your presentation that you speed up particles in the Hadron Collider to almost the speed of light. How do you manage to do that with the protons and stuff? Uh, well, what, 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 what you do is you, um, is first of all, uh, to, to, to accelerate any, any charged particle, you just make them go through an electric field. Okay. Um, now, that would be good enough. You can just imagine having just a long electric field in this direction, and then the particles go faster and faster and faster that way. Well, it's not very useful for this collision to happen off uh, in, in the middle of the ocean somewhere. So, um, and also, uh, it's not very effective to have this gigantic electric field go on forever. So, uh, what's better to do is to also bend the particle uh, so that you get to kick it again and again and again and again and again uh, and make it go faster and faster and faster. You bend it using magnets. It's really a lot like um, uh, uh, you know, like uh, with, with old non-digital TVs, uh, that, that, that's their, their electron guns that, that, that fire electrons. You put a magnet up to the TV, you make your parents angry, but you would see what it did. <laughs> uh, and um, it's, it's exactly the same principle. Okay, so you, we, so you, you use magnets to bend them, and, and that's why you put in a ring, so that it can go around and get a kick again and again and again and again and again and, again, and, again, and that's how you wind it up. Now, there's a particularly clever thing that's done to get, remember, there's protons going around the ring one way, and also protons going around the ring the other way. So the way you manage to do that is, is, uh, is, is, is kind of cool. You surround, you have these gigantic magnets. That's one of the biggest costs of the experiment, is actually the magnets. These are the most fancy super duper magnets uh, in the world. Um, but uh, in that little beam, in, in just in that little beam, uh, one of the beams of protons is going in this in a little hole here. Another beam is going through a little hole right next to it. And you just have to arrange to flip the sign of the magnetic field rapidly from one to the other. So that in the same little area, one of them is accelerated around this way, the other one is accelerated around the other. That makes life even a little harder. But uh, it's all done with the fancy magnets. Yes? Um, so there's no such thing in our world as an uh, empty space that consists of nothing? Oh. Well, I mean, it, it, there, there is such a thing as empty space that consists of, uh, of no matter, but uh, even in the absence of matter, any experiment that you would do to probe the nothingness will produce particles. So, uh, you know, this is, this is part of the problem in, in, in using the sort of metaphorical language to describe what is, is, is going on. Um, of course, uh, I'm not... And, and it's also part of the difficulty of language altogether in, in, in describing these processes. But the point is that if you think, if you think about the vacuum as having this roiling particles and antiparticles popping in and out all the time, then it will lead you to the correct answers to any question you might ask. So in particular, if you try to examine what might happen if you looked at a region of space with a magnifying glass and this, that, and the other, uh, it would actually happen that you pop out particles and, uh, and uh, antiparticles. So in that sense, it's not useful to think about space as empty. It's useful to think about space as being filled with these particles really in and out. So, um, so far what you study is a vacuum that you have created that consists the least amount of matter. Exactly, exactly. So, so that's, so, you know, all of these things that the accelerators are as evacuated as possible, because once again, we're not interested in what happens when protons smash into walls. And we think we understand that pretty well. We're interested in what, what happens when Quarks and gluons smash into each other at really short distances because that's when something new should happen that tells us something new about the laws of nature. So, is that vacuum you study really low in um, temperature wise? Like yes, temperatures are low. Yes, yeah. so I mean, you have to you have to evacuate things, make things as cold as possible. Yes, every everything that could eliminate actual material things from lying around so that you're really studying the vacuum. So, so how you do that right now? What's the technology that you use to create that? Know, the best vacuum they got right now. Um, I'm not sure what the. I'm not sure what the. Uh, do you have a good answer to the question? What the technology? I mean, uh, yeah, just pumps. I think. I mean, uh, <laughs> is there, I, is, I thought it was just pumps. If it's snazzier, maybe you can say. No, it's just pumps. Stand up. Ah, right oh, hello. Yes. Um, so when Higgs particles um, decay into two particles, 99% of the 
Yes, bottom four is 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah. And the other time are photons. I was just wondering, um, once it has a certain mass, the Higgs particle, as you said, has a certain mass, and when it's, right. once it's um, split into two particles, then I assume they should have equal energies. Right? right. So then how do you distinguish once the same mass is being distinguished or broken into two same energy particles? Yeah, actually, so so it, it, it'll it'll be as I said. It, um, that's why you don't actually even look for it. You don't uh, you don't really have that much of a way of discovering it when it decays the way it does, ninety nine point nine percent of the time. So in fact, it'll take a lot more. In a sense, if you want to be very conspiratorial, you might say, "Aha! The thing that you discovered that's decaying to two photons isn't the Higgs. It's something that looks exactly like the Higgs, but it doesn't decay to bottom quarks." How do you know it's a case of bottom? You can't prove to me that it came to a, to a bottom quarks. And, well, we'd have to do a lot more. It's the beginning of the discovery. You, you think you've seen it, and you have to do all sorts of other checks to convince yourself that it walks and talks and does everything like the Higgs, even though you're prevented from seeing what it does in the way that it wants to do it directly. Uh, I, I, I should say, uh, did, did that answer, answer your question? I'm not sure if it did. Yeah. Right, so let's forget about the bottoms, because, because the bottoms are just hopeless in the, in, 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 in the beginning. Um, she wants uh, to know how you distinguish two photons from two bottoms. Oh, I'm sorry, is that, was, that, was that your question? Oh, well, photons are photons and bottoms are bottoms. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so, uh, so um, I mean, there, there are many differences between them. Uh, and, and that whole big uh, onion of detectors uh, that, uh, that, that surround the collision region, their job in life is to tell you that particle is a photon, that particle is a bottom quark, that particle is a muon, and so on. Okay. So, for, I mean, photons are not bottom quarks. Photons are massless, photons are very charged, photons are photons, bottom quarks are bottom quarks. So, over here. Yes, sorry. With a, with a topic like this, with the high energy research that you do for undergraduates that obviously aren't anywhere near that level yet, what kind of path or, or recommendation would you make for a current undergraduate student who's really interested in this kind of topic, wants to know more about it, and might eventually want to be involved in it? What kind of path would you recommend at that level of education? You know, um, the, the wonderful thing about, about physics is that it's, um, it builds on itself, it's incremental, and um, uh, you have to love all of it. <laughs> Uh, in order to do research at the frontier. So um, there really isn't a quick and dirty path to get there. Uh, my best advice to undergrads is to learn physics, standard undergraduate physics, as deeply as you possibly can. Because if you don't learn it as deeply as you possibly can now, you'll have to suffer and learn it deeply later. <laughs> uh, so, but really, but more particularly, um, think about relativity as deeply as you can. Think about quantum mechanics as deeply as you can. Um, uh, I mean, take, take the courses, do every problem set, uh, you know, uh, if you want to be a theoretical physicist, you just have to love doing calculations. Um, uh, most of the time, nothing works, so, and things are very frustrating, and you're banging your head against the wall, so unless you actually enjoy the mechanical process of doing it, it's just hell. So, so, uh, so, so just learn, learn to enjoy, uh, learn to enjoy physics, um, and the, and, and and the essential foundational things for this subject are, are relativity and quantum mechanics. If you really think you have those under your belt, you should take a, a course on quantum field theory taught by any one of these outstanding theoretical physicists here. Um, and uh, and um, that's something that, that uh, um, I mean, it's not crucial, but if you do it, 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 it would be useful. Uh, and it's a subject that if you work in this area, you will, you will uh, be a student of for the rest of your life. It's not something that you do in a course and then it's done and you move on to the next thing. It's, 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 really, it's really very different. But if you get exposure to that early on, that, that's something that'll be good. But I, I really stress, it's, this, it's not a race. This is something often uh, undergraduates don't, 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 don't realize. It, it is not a race. If you're, if you're in the business, you're in, the, you're in it for, for, for the long haul. And it's just important to get the, the solid foundations right and build on that. You can take physics 130. <laughs> That was obviously a better answer. <laughs> hey, um, so my question is, 
Is there a good reason why uh, gravity is a uh, is only attractive and not repulsive? In the same way, like, for example, uh, electromagnetism has like positive and negative charge. There is an excellent reason for it. Um, um, How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm happy to explain it to you later, actually. I mean, it, 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 the, the, there, there's, there's an excellent reason for it, but it takes a little bit of time. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to explain. It, it, it is actually an inevitable consequence of uh, quantum field theory. Um, it's, an it's an inevitable consequence of the fact that uh, the gravity is described by, uh, well, the force of gravity is associated with exchanging gravitons between uh, uh, what we call virtual gravitons between particles. And the interaction of these gravitons, the kinds of interaction they have, they can have, are almost completely dictated. In fact, not almost, are completely dictated by the uh, by by the basic laws of quantum mechanics and, and, and relativity. Uh, you know, uh, people, Einstein had to come up with all these incredible <coughs> ideas to come up with general relativity. But if you knew about quantum mechanics, you would have seen there was absolutely no choice. It must look like that. There, there's no other way the world could possibly be. That's one of the things that happens. We learn more and more. Things are radically more constrained than, 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 than we thought. And the fact that gravity is attractive together with a huge number of other things about it are simply there's no other way it could be. And it's a direct consequence of, uh, of relativistic quantum mechanics. But, um, you know, it, it would be some argument writing down a few little tensors and uh, taking dot products and vectors into each other and stuff, stuff like that. It's a simple argument, but we have to do it offline. question about uh, how the vacuum is somehow maintained within this 27 kilometer uh, tube. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's a very interesting question because it's a very innovative way how, how vacuum is uh, uh, achieved in this tube. It is actually a material uh, coated on the entire tube inside. And this material is called the getter. And this material is the pump itself. A very interesting material which has a nanostructure, etc. And the interesting story about it is actually that it was developed uh, at CERN by uh, solid state physicists, surface scientists, for uh, the discovery you know, of Higgs boson or whatever we refer to today. So it was it's a technological discovery that was motivated by uh, fundamental physical. I have no idea. That's, that's a wonderful story. It's very interesting. I didn't know that. If you were able to create a machine that would measure down to 10 to the minus 33, and you were able to create a black hole, do you think that they would self perpetuate or extinguish themselves? Oh. The black holes? Yes. The black holes would instantly uh, disintegrate. And so if, you, if we did create black holes, what would that mean for the universe or uh, well, I mean, physics uh, or you see, the world? Uh, I mean, I, I, I perhaps should have emphasized that. Well, yeah. Um, uh, we've understood now for many, many years, there isn't that sharp a distinction between a black hole and an elementary particle. Um, when black holes are gigantic, they're you know, when stars collapse and make black holes, they're very, very big. Um, in, a, in a classical world, the black holes are black. But Hawking, uh, but Hawking taught us that uh, the black holes very gradually evaporate. They, they by, by quantum mechanical processes, lose energy and shrink. And they get smaller and smaller and smaller. You can, you can make big black holes. We have big black holes in the universe. There's a gigantic black hole in the center of the galaxy, for example. Um, and we have uh, lots of other evidence for other astrophysical black holes. These are very big objects. Um, now, gradually, quantum mechanically, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, they get uh, clunky in size, and they evaporate altogether. So there isn't much of a distinction between uh, black hole and, and, uh, and, and, and elementary particles. If you pump things up to higher and higher energies, you make what you use in usual language to be particles, and it gradually morphs into what you would call a black hole. But of course, it would be fantastic because uh, because understanding the sort of final stages of what happens as this black hole evaporates would teach us an enormous amount about the physics right around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, where we are still in the need of uh, of a deeper understanding of what the physics is. 
Okay, I think we're going to give Nima a rest because he's given five lectures so far this week and has three more to go. Yeah.